like to go through a little bit of a lecture on uh, the chapter 7 um, hydronics PowerPoint for circulators. Uh, specifically, I'm going to hit up on part 2, which relates to the performance of circulators. Um, I think there is some clarification that might be needed on some of this. Um, this is kind of, uh, can be complex to go through some of this stuff. So let me go through a few examples with these and I'll buzz through this uh, with you guys. So let's get uh, this started. All right. Um, let's take a look at this next one. All right, so the first thing I'm going to hit up on a little bit is just the explanation of a little bit of the circulator head. And essentially, the, a pump's head is really the energy that it's adding to that fluid or to that system. And it's, there's, no, you know, there's no direct correlation between the GPM and pressure or anything. Those are all very different um, characteristics of a pump and a pump curve. So we're going to take a look at some of the performance curves and I'll show you how to kind of use them and we'll look at some of the variations here in these. So, all right. So the first thing that I'd like to just point out is, is the mechanical energy added into this fluid. In this case here, you're looking at a, the pump head that you're adding from that circulator when it operates, when it's, when it's actually functioning is actually Technically, it's, it's the energy being added into the water, it's the pump head being added uh, as to overcome system resistance. So in the picture that we are looking at right here, I've got a pressure delta P of 6 PSI across the pump. So there's 16 PSI on the discharge side of the pump, there is 10 PSI on the inlet side of the pump. The the amount of energy or pressure that is that's being added is 6 psi now that 6 psi that you're adding into that as a differential is the resistance of the system at whatever flow rate is is being identified or measured now in this particular example that means that we have 10 gallons a minute against a pressure drop of 6 psi now the 6 psi mind you, is what the pump is actually creating for pressure, but that, that's the only correlation between GPM and flow, and that's unique to every system. So it's just really evidence that the pump is operating, that it's energy that we're getting a differential on there. If the pump weren't running, we would end up getting a big fat zero. We wouldn't get any pressure drop across um, the energy that it's being added. So let's take a look at, at this thing. So there's a, a couple of things, uh, and one of the things that I try to do as I was um, spending time making these PowerPoints is I tried to make sure uh, that I was putting my notes on here, that you guys would maybe be able to understand or relate to what was shown here. So the first thing I'd like to do is we're going to take a look at the first one, and uh, a couple of things I want to point out. Number one, um, this right here, this this little diagram that's shown there, that's actually going to be what I'm going to call, uh, let's call it a pump graph. And a lot of times I'll refer to that as the pump um, curve. Now the pump curve is different than really the graph. Sometimes, uh, so for example, I would say this right there, that actually is the pump curve. And the whole piece here together is the graph. So how do you develop that and how does that work? So essentially what will happen is on, the, on this particular curve, we're identifying flow rate on the very bottom. And we're going, it's just only showing it us from um, 0 GPM all the way up to 8 gallons a minute. And on the left side, this is actually going to be a delta P. Okay, now that delta P that's on this, uh, that's your differential pressure. So that would be the equivalent of us, what we're adding in energy or, or pressure, uh, what the pump is doing, what it's, and that, so that's a really important characteristic. So I want to point out a couple of things so you understand this. So in other words, if I take a look at this first application, number one, we're going to say, 
and I've got 10 PSI going into the inlet side of my pump and I measure 20 PSI coming out of the discharge of the pump. That right there is a difference or a delta P of 10 PSI. Now my chart or my pump curve that's shown here shows me 10 PSI and it goes over and it identifies that it has, um, that's where it intersects the curve. And then what it, you know, it, it identifies that that would represent two gallons a minute. So in the, in the field, we are, are not gonna probably know the GPM until after we measure the differential pressure, or the, in this case, the delta P, what's going in and out of a pump. And um, that's, it's all about understanding pressures and pressure losses. So that's the first one. So we have, that would be technically a point of operation. So let's take a look at the second point. The second point has a delta P of six PSI and it's got 10 going in, it's got 16 coming out. So I would have to say if I saw that, that would be compared to the first one, that would tell me that that pump has less resistance in the same system and ultimately would have more GPM. So we're gonna look at its pump curve and say that this particular system, all the way over until it, it till we find out where it intersects the curve and we find out that that is indeed six gallons a minute. So the six GPM is directly, we're identifying that straight from that curve. So um, six gallons a minute, that's my flow rate. The six PSI is my delta P. Now let's look at the, at the third example. Now this one has much lower resistance. It only has two PSI differential. And most of our pumps, you have to remember, are single speed pumps. So when that pump is energized, that pump runs at X speed, whatever that speed happens to be. And it's not full variable speed or anything like that. Um, so in this particular case, we have a delta P of two PSI. And if we look at the curve, delta P at two PSI, we go straight across here and we find out that that represents eight GPM. So that's a little bit on, on just really essentially what, how to kind of relate the flow of a pump or the delta P of the pump or the pressure across pump and how that relates to flow. Um, and every system is different and unique. So you just have to learn how to relate the, the curves and the pumps uh, to understand that. So a couple of other things. So um, if, there's a few notes that I added on here already that first of all is Normally we want to use a single gauge when we do this, uh, when we do these pressure differentials. So commercially, most oftentimes um, we'll see an application like this one. And what this one uses is it's got an arrangement where there's two valves, um, there's a pump or there's a line that comes out of the inlet and the outlet side, there's valves on both sides, and then there's a pump that's teed or a gauge that's teed off to identify what that pressure is. So you can close one valve, as it says, close one valve at a time, and then the other one is left open, and it'll read what that pressure is at the inlet side of the pump or the outlet side of the pump. And what you're looking at is the difference. And that's typical the way that you want to do that. Um, there are situations where we would put two individual gauges. Um, you know, you could have one gauge here and one gauge here. Now, the only downside of that is uh, is in, in that case, or even in the one that's below it, and you know, we'll call this one, we'll call this two. Um, one and two, the problem with that application or those is that I'm subject to the, let's call it the inaccuracies of each one of those gauges. So there are some questionable areas to, to do that. Uh, so I don't know if that, that's not the way I would do it if I could help it. If, you know, ideally you wanna use one gauge um, that's typically the way that it, it should be done, and it is normally done in the field. Um, the bottom one here, they're showing a differential pressure gauge. Now, that's a little bit, um, you know, it's a little bit nicer, higher-end system. Um, a balancer may, may use something like that. Um, they, may, they may have a gauge that, you know, can able, that's able to read very accurately what the def, differential pressure might be across a pump. Um, they're doing the same thing as what this system is. They're doing the same thing as the bottom two in these bottom two pictures. The only difference is 
this, this particular gauge has actually what I'm going to call a high port and it has a low port into that gauge. So they're actually giving you a delta P. It's very much like a magni helic gauge. You could think of it that way, uh, where you have a high and a low pressure port. Uh, so that's generally what it is. The, the big thing that I, would, that I would caution you guys, you know, we're looking for differential pressure. And as long as, as long as you keep your gauge at the same level or the same height, um, no matter where you take your readings, um, you're going to be able to identify uh, specifically what that delta P that the pump is adding. So that's typically the process that gets done. So that's, uh, anyways, that's a good, a good little process. So in this particular one here, um, I thought it'd be worthwhile putting the example from the book in here. So what I um, thought would be worthwhile doing is um, if we go through the example 7.1 in your textbook and it says, you know, in all the cases, the density of the fluid being circulated needs to be determined. The density of the water at 60 and, and 180 degrees can be found in figure 4.4. Four. Um, the density of the 50% solution of ethylene glycol can be found in the properties that's using that hyd um, hydronics design software suite. Um, they already gave you the numbers on all of these systems on here. And this is probably worth probably knowing to some extent. They're talking about the head being produced in each one of these can be determined based on the equation 6.5. You'll, you'll notice in A, B, and C, in all three of those situations, with despite different densities, the amount of head that is being added by that pump was the same in all in all of these cases. So it's saying the pressure rise across the circulator is different, um, yet when you compare the energy at, that's being corrected based on real life uh, densities, it ends up being the same. So that's kind of a, a good thing in here. So in, in, when we looked at the examples in, in this figure 720, you'll notice that this one's showing essential, let's call it a 10.8 PSID differential. You'll notice the next one is essentially going to be a 10.5 uh, PSI uh, differential. And then the bottom one is uh, the 11.4. And to some extent, um, that is, um, you know, it just kind of identifies that Yes, even though we're getting slightly different ones on here, different uh, densities, um, it, it's generally fairly minimal. Um, and the, in the end result, um, I don't know that anybody would really ever notice a whole heck of a lot um, as far as the differences on there. Typically, what most people will do when they do get systems that are using glycol, um, that will make a little bit of a difference because the density is a little bit different. They might put a slightly bigger pump in there and just make a slight correction uh, for that. So, all right, so let's take a look at this. So here's a, a good example. This next image here is a is figure 721. It's a sample pump curve. It's identifying the flow rate on the bottom here. It's identifying the heat added, or the head added, excuse me, in, uh, in, in feet of head. And you'll notice that every, you know, and every pump is going to have some sort of a curve. It'll identify, hey, what's the wide open uh, GPM and what is the uh, GPM at close, at full close. So you'll see um, this particular um, pump that we're dealing with here can, can exhibit or can actually do about 17 feet ahead at no flow rate. And it'll exhibit at no flow or no resistance. Uh, uh, it'll yield you almost 20 GPM, which of course there aren't really any systems that do zero flow or zero GPM. But the 17 feet ahead or zero GPM, we can't actually prove that simply by if we were to valve off a pump on the discharge and measure its pressure, you would see a differential about 17 feet ahead. And that actually is done in uh, in systems when you are questioning the pump and its performance so anyways that's a little bit on that let's take a look at the next one so the next one in figure 722 i've got a an entire grouping of pumps that are on a single graph and um, this is uh, 
This is an example of one by Taco. It's their integral flow check model um, curves. And you'll notice that there is a whole slew of different um, pumps that are on this single graph. And this is actually, in a way it's nice to have it, but in a way it gets a little bit busy. And um, this is the, that would be the only thing that I would say is like, eh, you know, I don't know if I wanna use that one. But on the other hand, a lot of times what you'll have is you might have um, pumps that you normally use already in mind. Um, so maybe you're gonna use a, you know, maybe you're, you figure you're gonna be able to use a 008 or a 007 or a 0010 pump. You already have an idea in your mind of how they're gonna they're gonna correlate. So specifically, if I use this 0014 pump that I'm gonna underline right here, 0014 IFC, that's pump curve number 13. So pump curve number 13 is in in a lot of ways you might say, well, geez, it really doesn't look like a curve. It looks more like a straight line. Some of these, it's just the way they design their pumps and the impellers. They can get some interesting characteristics. You'll notice that this 0014 pump will do about 23 feet of head um, when you don't have any flow rate. And then, but at its maximum flow, you'll notice that it can do almost 30 gallons a minute against no resistance. So what, where, you know, where this pump would normally be used, in fact, you could almost say this with all of these pumps, is you'd really like to kind of you try to pick your pumps where you can be in that middle third range. That's really where you're going to get the most efficiency. And um, figure out where that middle third range is for all of these types of pumps. And that's really where you'd like to be if you're going to operate them uh, in all cases. You'll notice in pump curve number 12, um, that's a double of 13. Now what's interesting about the double of 13 is that that double of 13 pump can do you know, 32, about 32.6, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 feet ahead, um, you'll notice up on top here, and um, that's, you know, against no flow, but it can do that 0013 pump, pump curve number 12, that pump can do almost, you know, it's like 33 and a half feet of, uh, or GPM, that's a lot of flow. Um, and you know but there again you're never going to run it down in this range where you don't have any any head so in most cases you know if i look at a system um, it just gives me one ability to look at many many of these different applications so for example a um, the 007 is a very common pump 007 integral flow check pump it's the ifc it's curve number five so when i look at this one you'll notice that that's gonna be this curve right there, that number five. And you'll notice that that's a fairly flat curve that, for example, at, oh, let's say about, um, let's say seven gallons a minute we'll use, roughly. I'll go halfway in between the six and the eight, so it's about seven, and I'm gonna go straight up Hopefully I went straight up on that. And you'll notice that that is roughly about, what looks to me like about maybe six and a half GPM, roughly something like that when I go straight across. So it gives you a little bit of an idea, you know, what kind of a performance am I gonna get out of that? So you, you kind of all have to relate a little bit to when we talked a little bit about resistances and about, um, you know, when we determine the system resistance based on your piping layout and, the, and all, the, all the parts and pieces that you have in your system, that's kind of one of those where um, you have to kind of think back to that because that's where all of this is coming from. That's where all this feed ahead business is coming from. And then our flow rate is really, you know, how do you want this to work and what, that, what is that going to do? So, all right. So here's another example. Um, this one here happens to be by Grunfoss. Now, um, it's just another, you'll notice that there's so many different types of, uh, so many curves. Um, this pump curve number two, that UP2699 F pump, that one has a curve, um, that's pump curve number two. You'll notice that that one will do 32 feet ahead at no flow, and it'll do as much as almost 33, um, 33 and a half GPM against no resistance. Um, 
and it you know it's got a fairly good uh, ratio on there so you know as you can tell about let's say at about 16 gallons a minute let's see if I can draw a straight curve or a straight line up here and you'll notice that 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 one is gonna it'll give you about 16 gallons a minute against um, roughly about oh, I'm thinking it's probably in the 22 ish somewhere in that 21 22 GPM range so helps have a little bit of a nice straight line uh, to do these uh, to be able to identify that but you know that's that's kind of what it it's needed the the beauty of this stuff you know I I know when you're learning it for the first time you have to um, learn you know you look at some of the papers and you look at some of the graphs and you try to understand what they're doing with it they actually have software programs that are on almost almost every manufacturer has an app where you can go in there and you can tell it um, what your system resistance is at a certain flow rate and it'll actually plot the curve for you it'll draw the system curve and it'll plot it right on the pump curves and the, I mean it's super accurate um, it's very very nice on it and again all of this is really kind of an estimate a little bit um, especially if you're doing it from the initial standpoint um, once you you know once you have some real data um, then it's totally different then once you have the real data then you know that hey this is what I really had um, and now all right I want to use a different pump what do I do so it, it's pretty neat on on that so pump curve number six I'll just hit that one up a little bit um, I've drawn a line in here already that pump curve six you'll see can do you know almost 15 feet ahead um, against no floor and about 17 gallons a minute at wide open well you're not going to run it at wide open but let's say that you were going to run it at 12 uh, GPM you know is it really possible to do 12 GPM and you'll see that the system is probably going to be about I'm guessing about five feet ahead five and a half feet ahead or so based on what I'm seeing here at 12 gallons a minute so you could say well you know the 12 gallons a minute represents the flow rate the five five and a half feet ahead something like that represents the frictional resistance that the pump is working against so that's a little bit on that just another example all right so I talked a little bit about the system resistance curve and the system resistance curve is is really the essential starting point and it's it's you have to have some idea what is the system resistance now um, in in an exact system in the field we would just simply say let's go ahead and get what your pressure differential across the pump is if it's possible to get it um, of course it requires you to be able to measure certain pressures um, or identify what those pressures would be and you make your best guesstimate so that's a little bit on there so how do you do that well uh, what we start out is we start out with some usually some some system operating point or some design point so and that's typically what happens so in this one here let's say that my design or expected operating point maybe is I don't know maybe it's um, straight down from this one here I don't know if that represents uh, nine and a half um, nope not probably 8.7 gallons a minute and it represents whatever that resistance is maybe that's um, 11 12 um, in that area 12 and a half 13 um, feet ahead and of course using the pump laws which there is a um, there's a separate PowerPoint just for the pump laws and going through them and it's that's really where we we plot it out and you can um, you can actually and I'll go through an example later with you guys on this but this is um, one of the things that you have to do so what we're doing is it's all a squared relationship so I'll I'll just draw out the formula a little bit here but essentially when I would do this in the in, in an application I would put on there the GPM that I would you know make up a number two let's say against the GPM that is original and I'll just put that as number one and then we'll basically square that quantity times the resistance what I'm gonna call is the resistance of number one so it'd be whatever the flow rate is of this one against you know whatever that resistance is so in this case here if I were setting this this up and I said well I want to know what would be the resistance 
of this one at, let's say, 12 gallons a minute. And let's say that this one represented, oh, let's say, 8.7 GPM as an example. So I, the way I would set this up is 12 uh, GPM over uh, the 8.7 GPM. And I would square that quantity and I would multiply that by the resistance of what you had at the 8.7. And the resistance that I had at 8.7, if this is 11, 12, 13, 14. So it looks to me like it's about roughly 13. So I'll just say 13 feet of head. All right. So. Crazy stuff. Oh, my God. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try this again here. So 12, in this case, divided by 8.7. And I'm going to hit equals, and that comes out to 1.3793. I'm going to square that quantity. I'm going to multiply that by 13 feet ahead. So that means that it would be about 24.7 based on my, my guesstimation. So, and in that case, if I you know went straight across here, I would hope that I'd be hitting the 24.7, essentially, is the way I would be looking at that. So... That's the way that it's supposed to work. So that's really kind of the process of, of, doing, of doing that. So, and then obviously, um, if I pick a lower, you know, a lower GPM as an example at, let's say, 6, what would be its feet ahead across here? And I'd calculate that out. And it, what it would look like in the end is it would look like an actual curve, like this blue line is showing here. Um, and every one of those calculated points where you see a star on, that is a calculated point. You always know that it's always at zero GPM, it's always going to be zero feet ahead. That's a given. It always will be that way. So that's how you simply do that. All right. So the next example that we are going to see, it's talked about where the calculated system resistance curve, uh, the, the resistance curve intersects the pump curve. So in the example that they identify out of your textbook in 724, they're showing the system curve that was calculated. And so there might have been a whole bunch of little points that they calculated uh, on here and using the second pump law. And then this represented the manufacturer's pump curve, and they told us, you know, what that would be. So I'm just simply kind of drawing the system curve on the pump curve to try to figure out where that operating point's going to be. And your system will always, your system curve will always intersect that uh, operating point, or it'll always intersect the, you know, wherever it intersects that pump curve, that's where it's going to, to be the operating point. So in this example, um, it's clearly showing us that our, where we found equilibrium, the head at equilibrium or hydraulic equilibrium is at 11 feet ahead. Um, we're getting roughly what looks like about 7.8 gallons a minute. And um, that's essentially the flow rate at a hydraulic equilibrium. You'll always, always, always get that. Um, you'll always be, you're always going to find that point of operation simply in any system um, when that when that exists. So all right. So now if um, You know what happens if the resistance of the system changes, you know as an example, so Anytime that let's say that I say the hey, you know what? Um, I had a bunch of zone valves open up or a bunch of zone valves closed down or I had a Y strainer get dirty as an example You're either going to shift this system resistance curve will either shift this way or it'll shift this way, and um, it will, but it will always ride in that pump curve. So if I have more resistance because a bunch of valves are closing, it'll move to the left. And if I have a bunch of valves opening, it would then move to the right. And uh, it, but it will follow that. It'll follow this pump curve. So in other words, if if let's say that I had some valves that opened up 
or I you know, eliminated some resistance out of a system, what would happen is maybe my new operating point would be down to here. Well, that would shift the entire curve all the way down to where it would cross that point up to here is the way it would work. So that's a, just a little bit of an example on that. And then of course, if I, you know, I start closing down valves left and right, that curve would now shift. Maybe it's gonna operate over here. And um, so the, ultimately that goes back to this curve um, that we looked at over here where, you know, if this is my real pump curve and I determine, hey, I'm, you know, I'm operating over here and the same thing goes. If, if all of a sudden, uh, you know, I decide I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up some valves and change the characteristic of the system, you're simply gonna move up or down. You're gonna simply move this way or this way, one or the other. All right, let's move to this. So this is the, this curve um, showing the system curve and the pump curves together. So what happens in real life sometimes is you might have three or four different pumps that you may want to choose. And you're trying to figure out which one should I buy? Which one should I pick that's gonna best fit my application? So the first uh, one I wanna look at here from my application is uh, we're gonna look at circulator number one. And, um, and we've got, remember now, we have circulator one, two, and three. And those particular one, I'm just gonna change the color here just to uh, make it a little bit different, is circulator one, two, and three. So we have 7.4 gallons a minute at 10.2 feet ahead, and that's on pump one. So if we take a look at 10.2, 10.2, we are going to be right at this point right there, okay? And that one is gonna give me about 7.4 gallons a minute. Now, that pump curve, you know, is, is maybe good for certain applications. Um, it would not be good for a zone system. That would not be the best pump on there. So uh, we're gonna take a look at some other ones. And there's a reason behind that. That's considered a steep curve and that would not be a good one for a zone system. So let's take a look at the next one. So if we take a look at, at, let's say, pump curve number two. And pump curve number two, it doesn't really give you as much head. Um, over on this side, you'll notice the head is only about a maximum of, let's say, 16 and a quarter, 16 and a half feet ahead at no flow, but that's not where we're operating. Where the system curve intersects that pump curve is actually at this point. So we're, it's doing it right there. And that particular one is giving us about 7.8 gallons a minute, and it, but that will give us about 11, uh, 11 feet ahead. You know, it would make sense because you're giving a little bit more flow rate on that system with that pump. And of course that represents, um, you would expect it to have more resistance if you're moving more flow rate in, with the same exact system. So that's kind of the, the objective of that. So what's the beauty of this is we've just taken a single system curve that's shown right here and we just drew that on one of those graphs which have multiple curves on them. And uh, of course the third pump uh, curve that's shown on here would only have given us 4.9 gallons a minute at 4.8 feet ahead. And of course, you know, maybe that's sufficient, maybe it's not. Um, I like the fact that this one and I like that this one are very flat curves and that I really like, whoops, flat curves. Um, I like that because of the fact that those flat curves um, are not going to see a big change in pressure when I start having valves closed down and I'm talking specifically zone valves, things like that. So but uh, it's just a better application. So as far as I'm concerned, I would think the best pump that would be on here most likely would be circulator number two. That would make the most sense. So let's take a look at what, what do we mean by this? this flat curve and steep curve business. So let's see what that's all about. Well, the, the steep curves are, you'll notice that um, this steep curve pump that we're looking at, it's a high head circulator that we're showing you. And, the, the reason or why we call it steep is the fact that there are, with very little changes in flow rate, we, we are going to have fairly high changes in head, in feet ahead. 
And um, that's the probably the biggest reason. So you'll notice that if let's say that I were operating a system with, if I were operating a system, let's say with eight GPM, and all of a sudden there was some, you know, dirt, something got dirty in the system and, and the flow rate started to drop down. So we would expect the flow rate to drop, but what it would do in actuality is, you know, if my flow rate dropped, the amount of head that the pump would create would actually increase. So that, in, so technically we shift up on this curve and that would be my new operating point. Now you might notice that, holy cow, you know, we have, um, we went from uh, 10 feet ahead up to, you know, 18 feet ahead and we only lost two GPM. That's a very steep curve. That's, you know, would, would be something where you want, you know, maybe you had a coaxial coil, maybe you had a system where, you know, there are Y strainers that could potentially get dirty and I want to make sure that I'm not seeing these big changes in flow rate. That would be why you would use something like that. In zone systems, um, you, very, you very rarely ever want to have that. You almost always want a very flat curve. This would be, you know, ideal um, is what you'd like to see. So you want a flat curve as a general rule because I don't want a lot of resistance change. So let's take a look at this. So multi-zone system. So what I have is um, I have a pump that's got a very flat curve in this next image on 728. And what's, what's so nice about this is I've got a system that has, um, it's essentially got four zone valves that are open in this system here. And so I'll draw this in orange. So you'll notice that when all the zone valves open, we're going to operate right at this point. And maybe that happens to be nine, nine and a half gallons a minute or so, you know, so that's, that's really what we're doing. Now, when I start having the next, when the next zone valve closes, that's actually going to shift the curve over to that point. And so where it intersects the pump curve, which is actually going to be right here. And when the zone, when three zone valves are open, so this fourth zone valve closed, now I've got three zone valves that are left open and my point of operation now will change it so that maybe now we're going to operate closer to you know six and a half gallons a minute against a feet of head which would be probably in the nine and you know nine nine feet head range maybe give or take and then of course when we go to uh, two zone valves open that you'll notice that there's very, very little change in pressure. So what the emphasis here is understanding why this impact and this change of pressure is so essential. So you'll notice that there's very little change in pressure and if there's not a big change in pressure differential across the pump, that would pretty much guarantee that we are not gonna see substantial changes in flow rate through the remaining open zones. And that's, that's really the biggest factor. What you absolutely do not want is a situation where you have a multi-zone system and when I only have this one little room calling that the pump starts to run so much water because it's got, it can make so much differential pressure to overcome the, the added resistance with more flow it, it will really make a lot of noise and it's, it's not a good system. So you don't, you definitely do not want that to happen. Um, so this is, a, like I said, a flat curve is always desirable whenever you have a, uh, a system like that. Um, so let's take a look at the next one. Uh, the next one I'd like to take a look at is with a multi-speed pump curve. So um, in our lab, we have several of the pumps that had multi-speed. So they had a, it's like a PSE motor with, you know, with three different speeds on it. And uh, maybe you have a low, medium, and high as an example. Well, the process of how we apply this and look at this is very much the same. The beauty of a three-speed pump is the fact that it just opened up flexibility big time. It gave me a little bit of wiggle room that I, I have an option of anywhere from the lowest to the highest speed, but usually people know already, you know, if you go onto an application and you're gonna know what you're gonna wanna use, whether it's gonna be speed two, 
and I'll have speed three in case or speed one, uh, you know, and the other ones that are, uh, you know, it just get, it opens it up rather than have to put three different pumps on, um, shouldn't, should it be wrong. So um, in this particular case, you'll notice that they, you know, if you look at, at this operating point, that's the first one. The high speed is going to give you about 19.6 GPM at five and a quarter. If I drop it to speed three or speed two, I should say, or, or the medium speed, you'll notice that we're just simply following the system resistance curve. So wherever you plotted that by picking your points um, and wherever that intersection occurred, that's where that point of operation be. So now if I switch to speed two, that will then change at medium speed. That'll drop the flow rate to 16 and a half GPM at 3.9 feet ahead against, your, against working at 3.9 feet ahead. And then of course at low speed, you're gonna operate at 13 GPM and 2.6. So again, it's a, the beauty of this is it, it gives us three pumps in one and it just allows us to, uh, to, to match what we need. So it's a good, really nice application uh, for systems like this. All right, so I tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to do an example with you. Um, this one I did not include in your PowerPoint, um, but I'm gonna do this. Usually I did this in class, but uh, uh, I think I'm going to do an example with you uh, while, while I'm in the process of this. So, all right, so what I wanna do is this. I'm gonna pick a few different points. So the, I'm gonna say that I've got a system that is going to have, oh, let's say 10 GPM against 12 feet ahead. So that's gonna be what I'm gonna say is my, op, is my uh, design point. So, and I wanna pick a pump. So design point is 10 GPM at uh, 12 feet of head. All right, so the, I think what I need to do is I need to plot that curve. So in this particular case here, I'm just gonna pick some other points out of the thin blue air. So I think what I'm gonna pick out of here is, um, let's start out with maybe eight GPM. So I'm gonna pick uh, essentially eight over the 10, and I'm gonna square that, and I'm gonna multiply that times 12. And then I'm gonna pick another point of four uh, GPM, and it'll be four GPM over 10. I always go back to my original point. I'm gonna square that times 12, and this is the feet ahead. This is feet ahead. And I'm gonna pick what these are. And then I'm gonna pick, I know what zero and zero is gonna be, so I know for sure it's gonna end up down there. I'd like to find out where it's gonna be up on the top part of this as well. So I'm gonna to try to pick maybe, I've got uh, 10, so I'm thinking maybe, let's just shoot for, Hmm, maybe 14. So 14 uh, GPM over 10 GPM. And I'm gonna square that times 12 feet. And I'll even pick, uh, we'll see where we're at in this, but I can pick even um, 16 to see where that runs. So 16 GPM over 10 GPM. And I'm going to square that times 12 feet. All right, and then figure those out. So that's what we need to do. So let's see if I can get my, my app calculator up here. Hopefully I won't get any more funny business again like before. And okay, so this one, there we go. That's a little bit better. All right, so the first one we're going to take a look at is 8 divided by 10 equals, that's 0.8. And of course, we're going to square that times 12 feet ahead. So that's gonna be 7.68 feet ahead. All right, so in this case, what that um, forces me to do is this. So we're looking at, uh, let's see, eight gallons a minute, 7.68 feet ahead. So eight, 7.68. So now, you, and it's a little bit of a guesstimation here, but 
So if that's 5, 6, 7, um, 0.68, I'm going to guesstimate that it's going to be about right there. And it's just a guess. So that's, and that's plenty close for normal run-of-the-mill um, work on this stuff. So let's take a look at the next one. So the next one, we're going to go 4 divided by 10, which is 0.4. We're going to square that number, and that is going to equal 0.16, and I'm going to multiply that times 12, 1.92. So, wow, you can really tell that's, that's really going down. So at the 4, we're at about 2, 1.92. So we're going to guesstimate down there. So you can kind of see, to some extent, that my curve is looking... Um, a little bit like this. So we don't really care what's doing on the bottom here. And I just, it's going to look like what they call a parabola. That's going to be a curvature. So based on what I can see there, you can kind of anticipate that we're going to be up in this region, probably somewhere up in this area when we finish this up. So we're going to guesstimate what this is going to look like. So this one said was 1.92. And then let's go to 14. The next one we'll do is 14 divided by 10, which of course is 1.4. We're going to square that times 12, and that is going to be 23.52. And that's feet of head. And of course, 23.52. And of course, um, 14 gallons a minute. And we're going to be halfway in between these two. And I said 23.52. So we're just under that. So I would put us at about here. And so based on my guesstimation is that I would say that we're now starting to, to go right up in this region. And if you can, you can probably guesstimate that we are going to be well beyond the curve at 16. So I'm going to do 16 divided by... 10 and I'm going to square that times 12 and of course that's 30.7 whoops 30.72 feet ahead and of course let's see what that does for us so we've got whoops come on here let's see if we can get this to go back out all right so we've got 30.72 and I think I'd said somewhere on, what did I say, 16 GPM. So we're going to be right at that point. So that puts us at roughly about here. So as you can tell, we're well beyond the curve. And if we kept going on and on and on, you could see how steep it would start to get on there. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what that curve should look like. Now... What do we do with all this stuff and how do we how do we do this? So now it pretty much tells me that if you know if I want to operate and I'm gonna if let's say that I want to use pump curve number six, this is gonna be my point of operation. Now, so pump six would be the UP 1542F pump. And if I say, well, I want to use pump curve number five, then it's gonna operate right here at pump curve number five. So Pump curve 5 would be the 2664 pump, and that would give us just about 12, uh, just under 12 GPM against a resistance that would be closer to somewhere really close to about 17-ish in that area, I guess, um, looking at that. So you get a little bit of an idea that um, it, it allows us to predict performance of a system no matter what pump that I choose, it allows us to pick. It allows us to pick that is the way that it works. So it's pretty pretty neat how that works. So hopefully that helped you a little bit of just understanding the a pump curve.